I just switched into this class from here what, do, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, okay. one, but the travel letter is the same and everything. Perfect. Thank you. All right, everyone, 1015. Let's go ahead and get started. Uh, I just want to let everyone know I am recording. So just like last week, remember that I always record these lectures if you want to go back and review or for some reason, you know, you got a flat tire or whatever, you can always go back and review these lectures. Um, just so you know, though, I wouldn't wait until right before the exam to watch these videos in succession, especially for a 75 minute class that's going to be excruciating for you. So just make sure if you miss class to catch up on the lecture right away so you're not doing this all at the very end. All right, just as I promised everyone, why don't you go ahead and get your top hat devices out. I do have three questions today that will help us review from last week and set us up for the lecture today, okay? Um, while we're doing that, uh, I will pass out problem set number two, part one, and we're going to actually get to some of those equations today too. All right, so the first question here, the first question is a definition, and remember terminology is pretty big on the first exam as well. This is the movement of molecules from one location to the other as a result of random thermal motion. Okay, so this is a definition. Is this the definition of secretion, diffusional equilibrium, diffusion, or osmotic pressure? We're going to start off easy, all right, pretty easy. Second one's easy, and the third one's hard. <laughs> All right. I think we have about 60 people in this class. So when we get to about 45, I'm going to give a countdown. We'll go 10 seconds. <clears throat> All right, we're stuck on 39. Oh, 40. Okay, I'll, I'll count down now. Um, give you about 10 more seconds. All right. Does anyone need a little more time in this room? Okay. I'll give you a cup. I'll give you about 25 more seconds. Just give me a thumbs up if you get it. Computer's not connecting. Okay. Um, I know you're here, so. Yes. Same. Okay. All right. Uh, try to get to the next two. Usually I take for points. I take the question where the most students have answered. The question where most of the students have answered. All right. So the correct answer is diffusion, right? This is the Definition of diffusion, so good job. Most of you got that right. I know it's early. Um, but let's see how you do on the second question. All right. This one says, net diffusion will always proceed from blank concentration to blank concentration. Like I said, pretty easy, just jogging our memory. It's like our workout at the gym. This is our warm-up. Is it net diffusion will always proceed from high concentration to low concentration, A? Net diffusion will always proceed from low to high? Or will it proceed from molar to osmolar or from low to zero? All right, so we're up to 42. I'll give you about 10 more seconds. You both having troubles with the connectivity yet? No, okay, you're good. You're still, okay, no worries. Give you about 10 more seconds. Again, we'll try to answer that third question, and that's the one I'll take to points if everyone can get that. All right, anyone else having any trouble? 
Okay, still having a little bit of trouble? Give me about five more seconds. And if you don't get the second one, let's just try to get this third one. All right, so this one's gonna take a little longer anyway because it's a little, this next one is a little more difficult. So I'm gonna go ahead and close this. You'll have another opportunity, so don't worry. And the correct response is A, right? Good job. All right, so 95% of you got that right, okay? So here's the one that's a little bit more difficult, okay? So this one is the chemical or concentration gradient can be thought of as A is a statistical force, B an electrical force, C a current, or D flux. Okay, for this one, I know that it's harder. So I want you, if you want to, you can turn to your neighbor, you can discuss it. <laughs> oh, you got the wrong code? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, don't worry about it. Um, it. You'll have to just, you know, either talk to a top hat representative or, you know, um, but you can switch over. Okay. So I know you're here. Why don't you just put it on a piece of paper and I'll make sure that you get those points. Okay? Yeah. 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 All right. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right. We're up to about 36. I'm going to give you about 10 more seconds. Uh, are you still having some connectivity issues? You are? Okay. Why don't we come up after class? And Yep. All right. Okay, so we've got 45. I think this is pretty good. Um, I'm going to go ahead and close this. Does anyone else need a little more time? Okay. Okay. Okay, sure. All right, this is always a fun one. We'll see if you fit the pattern from good. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and close this, and the correct response is A. All right, most of you got that right. That's awesome. In my first uh, section, it was split 50-50 between A and D. 50-50. All right. Um, I'm really glad you, that you got that correct. Remember that uh, concentration gradi gradient or chemical force can be thought of as a statistical force. It's really just about probabilities. And I want you to keep that in mind when we're going through the lecture today. Okay? All right. So let's go ahead and start. Um, I'm going to just pass this out to the first row, if you wouldn't mind passing this back. We will be going through some of the problems today. There you go. There you go. Oops, I'm going to grab one for myself. There you go. There should be plenty for everyone. We actually will be going through the first question today. All right? That should set you up for most of, a lot of, the part one and part two. Part two is actually just more of the same. It's more practice for you. OK? All right. This is always a fun lecture for me. Theology courses, they may roll out these concepts, but then they just say, take a look at the textbook and figure it out on your own. And so I don't do that. I actually really want to walk you through it so that you completely understand these concepts. So today we're actually going to start with diffusion of charged particles. All right? Now, I actually um, go to Pilates four times a week, <laughs> and I always, <laughs> okay, there's a, 
there's a point to this. Um, and I always, um, when I'm there and they have you in the squat position for what seems like five minutes, they go, okay, now we're gonna add on. And then they have you like stand on your toes and close your eyes and it's just like really embarrassing. But that's what we're gonna be doing today. We're adding on, okay? This is an add on. All right, so uh, I do have basically the um, learning objectives. Let me move over here. So the learning objectives are on the slides. You can go through them on your own at home. This is just going to help you study. And here is actually where I want to start. Okay. So uh, when we're talking about the resting membrane potential or equilibrium potentials, I have to now introduce what's called an electrical force. This is in addition to the chemical force or the concentration gradient that we've been talking about. Okay, so when we talk about an electrical force, you can think about it this way. Take a look at the very top of this particular diagram. And uh, basically what this is saying is if we take a look at an ion, for instance, an ion actually has a charge associated with it. And with that charge, it actually creates an electrical field where that electrical field, imagine this electrical field around the ion. The electrical field can actually do work on itself, or in other words, influence kind of the movement of itself and of other ions around it. Okay, so it can actually do work on itself and influence the movement of other ions around it. Okay, so think about that electrical field. Okay, so now this electrical field, if you actually have a lot of charges next to each other, the force actually increases with the quantity of charge. So the more charge, the more force it's going to exert around it, okay? Also, the force is going to increase as two ions become closer together. So as the distance shortens, the force is going to increase. Make sense so far? All right, so I want you to think about it like magnets, all right? These charges are just like magnets. Like charges are going to repel, and unlike charges are going to attract. Okay, so keep that in mind as well unlike charges are going to attract. All right, so uh, does anyone actually know um, what, has anyone taken physics? Okay, do you remember what law this is that kind of describes this? Um, I, I don't mean to put you on the spot. <laughs> it's maybe even been a while. Uh, no, I no, know. okay. Yeah, it actually is Coulomb's law. Okay, so this is Coulomb's law. Let me just write it on the board for you. I'll write it low so you can kind of see underneath the screen here. Uh, if someone needs me to actually lift the screen, just let me know. But this is actually saying that force, just as I was talking about before, is equal to constant times one charge times two charges, two charges in question, over distance squared. Okay? So just as we talked about, as you increase, can you, as, can everyone see this? Okay, so as the charges increase, so does the force. Remember, these are going to have a direct relationship because charge is in the numerator. All right? As the distance increases though, especially because this is a squared value, Right? As the distance increases, it's going to have an inverse relationship. The force is going to decrease. All right? This is Coulomb's law. We're going to be talking about Coulombs, the unit Coulombs, which is just a unit of charge. Okay? We'll talk about that in a little bit. Pretty good? Everybody feel pretty comfortable about this? All right, good. So going to this next one, I'm going through this slowly because these are difficult concepts, actually. And it can get very hairy 
very quickly, okay? So um, now you already understand what a chemical force is or um, the concentration gradient, right? We've already talked about that. And that is basically on your left-hand side, the chemical gradient. It's just referring to the concentration gradient, which again is just a statistical force, all right? Now, on the right-hand side, I want to introduce the electrical force, the electrical gradient, okay? So we're going to talk about the resting membrane potential in just a second. But if you take a recording electrode, and you just impale the cell. So you're just measuring this inner leaflet here. You can see these negative charges. That is the resting membrane potential that you can measure. It is actually comparing the inner leaflet compared to the bath, which you've set at zero. Okay, zero millivolts. So this is really a potential difference, right? If the outside is zero and this inner leaflet, leaflet here is negative, that's what we're calling a resting membrane potential. And you can, you can actually measure this with a voltmeter, which I'll talk about in just a second. Okay? All right. So this next slide is telling you something about that inner leaflet. I just want to make sure that everyone's on the same page here. But the two bulk solutions, right, have a value of zero millivolts, right? There's no charge. I mean, the charges are exactly equal. So in the bulk solution, right, there should be a measurement of zero millivolts, OK? But you can actually see right at the plasma membrane, remember this, you know, think about the cell, right at the plasma membrane, there is a potential difference because the plasma membrane is acting as a capacitor. OK, you don't need to have known. I mean, you don't have, have to have taken physics, so don't worry. I'm going to explain it to you now. A capacitor is simply a storage of charge. It's the ability for this plasma membrane to store charge. OK, so a capacitor stores charge, all right? And you can see, and if you need some text when you get home, just know that this slide actually has some text associated with it, so you can read it also at home. Pretty good? All right. So here's our voltmeter. Just want to make sure that I reinforce this particular concept, if you can see that all right. You have this instrument, again called a voltmeter. You have both a recording microelectrode, this is the intracellular microelectrode. And you have the reference electrode that's actually referring to the bath. OK? Uh, that's the extracellular microelectrode. OK? You always calibrate it and set the reference or the extracellular electrode to zero. And then you can impale the cell and measure the resting membrane potential. So here's what you see. At first, the recording before you impale the cell, is zero millivolts. But as soon as you stick that electrode in the cell, just right through the plasma membrane, and you're measuring the inner leaflet, you can see the resting membrane potential, it's almost instantaneous, goes to minus 70 millivolts. OK? So that's how the voltmeter works. That's what we're talking about with the resting membrane potential. OK? We're going to learn how to predict the resting membrane potential using the Goldman-Hodgkin cats or the cord conductance equation. Okay, so don't worry that you don't know that yet. I will walk you through that. Okay, that's probably going to be on Thursday. Okay, so now we know that every cell in your body has a resting membrane potential. So get this. Every cell in your body has a negative resting membrane potential. Usually it ranges between minus 100 and minus 20 millivolts. So muscle cells are very hyperpolarized. You don't know that formally yet. That just means it's very negative hyperpolarized at minus 90 millivolts. 
Red blood cells, more like minus 20 millivolts. Okay, so that's pretty much the range. And why does this happen, right? It happens because you actually have a different, you have a concentration gradient across the plasma membrane, which is different for sodium, different for potassium. We actually talked about this last time. Uh, for sodium, sodium is very high on the outside relative to the inside. Potassium is the opposite. Potassium has a very high concentration inside the cell relative to the outside. And these concentration gradients and the conductance differences. So you don't probably know this yet, but each cell has a high conductance for potassium. Conductance, you can think right now as pathways for sodium, or I'm sorry, for potassium to leak out of the cell. Okay, it's the conductance and the concentration gradient that are playing a role in setting the resting membrane potential. Don't worry if this isn't gelling yet. It's not until you actually start running the numbers where you're like, oh, this is starting to become very clear. So I'm going to hold off on my explanations to just kind of an introductory type. And then once you start running those numbers and doing the problem sets, it will all become very clear. Okay? All right. So this is pretty much the last slide that I want to go through for this particular lecture four. I'll get into Julius Bernstein in just a second. But here you go. Here are how every cell in your body... These are what the concentration gradients look like. High sodium, the bigger the uh, acronym there, the bigger it's Na is sodium, K is potassium. So the bigger the visual is, the more, the higher the concentration. Okay? So you have high sodium on the outside, low sodium on the inside, high potassium on the inside, low potassium on the outside. Okay, so why is it? Why is it set up this way? We kind of, we had one student that actually talked about this correctly last time. Why are these concentration gradients set up this way? There's one, I call it the engine of the cell. Yes. That's exactly right. The sodium potassium ATPase is an active transporter. It's a primary active transporter that uses ATP, the energy from the hydrolysis of that ATP, to set up these concentration gradients, which are, if you think about it, potential energy. Without the pump, the sodium potassium ATPase, which I call the pump as well, without the pump, the cell is dead. All right, that's how important that pump is. I, I refer to it as the engine of the cell. All right, so now you remember that we have this electrical force now that we have to tie into everything. We have this potential difference across the membrane. All right, so um, the electrical force is pretty much the membrane potential Now, I'm going through this slowly because this is also a source of confusion. Membrane potential, we measured with a voltmeter, is really a potential difference, right? Okay, so membrane potential is really a potential difference. Oops. Difference. These words are kind of synonymous which is also what people refer to as the membrane voltage. When I say any one of these, I'm saying the exact same thing. All right? Membrane potential is the same as the potential difference, is the same as the membrane voltage. And when I say the resting membrane potential, that's what the membrane potential is when the cell has not been activated and it's at rest. So action potentials, when they fire, the cell's not at rest anymore. So I can't call it the resting membrane potential. Pretty good? Okay. So taking a look at our figure here, 
Let's just consider sodium for now. You already have some intuition about sodium, high concentration on the outside, low on the inside. So if we're only taking into account the chemical force, the chemical gradient, the concentration gradient, how is the net diffusion going to proceed? Easy question. Yep, it's going to go from outside to inside. That's going to be the net diffusion. Remember, this is just a statistical force. What's it going to take? What's the membrane voltage going to have to be in order to prevent sodium from coming into the cell? And we're talking about the inside, the inner leaflet. What is the membrane voltage going to have to be in order to prevent the net movement of sodium into the cell. It's like magnets. What do you think? If you want to turn to your neighbor just to have a conversation for a minute, everyone looks a little like deer in the headlights to me right now. <laughs> Oh, yeah. So what would the inside, uh, do I have a little arrow here? Yeah. See my little arrow? What would the inside membrane voltage have to be in order to prevent the net movement of sodium down its concentration gradient into the cell? OK, what do you think? What would it have to be? It would have to be really positive, right? Why is that? Because if the inside of the cell is really positive, it's going to influence the movement of sodium into the cell. And sodium is actually going to repel, right, and not come into the cell. All right. So this is actually what we theoretically called, if I figured out the exact voltage that I would have to imply within the cell, the exact voltage to prevent the net movement of sodium down its concentration gradient to where there's no net movement, where the chemical force exactly equals the electrical force. I've got it to the point where there's no net movement. That's what's called the equilibrium potential. And you have to calculate the equilibrium potential for every ion. All right, so take a look at this. Let me, I think this is a really important one. So I'm going to make sure that everybody kind of sees this graph. And this is actually on your sheet. This is one C. This is the graph that I would actually want you to, to uh, draw. All right. So on the y-axis here, this is membrane potential in millivolts. Okay, It's also going to be equilibrium potential. And I'll explain that later. OK? So what did we just say? We just said that the inside of the cell would have to be fairly positive in order to prevent the net movement of sodium down its concentration rate. Okay? So in that case, I rolled out the idea, this would be our equilibrium potential. That's the potential that would have to exist in order to prevent the net movement of sodium down its concentration rate. Okay? Don't worry, you're going to see this over and over again. And again, it's not until you're going to run these numbers until you're actually going to understand it. All right, so I'm going to say, just theoretically, we haven't calculated anything, but our equilibrium potential for sodium is going to have to be fairly positive. 
The reason why I used a dashed line is because I haven't measured anything. This isn't a real measurement. This would have been the calculated value of the voltage that would have to exist in order to prevent the net movement of sodium down its concentration rate. Pretty, you guys with me? All right, so going back here, let me just see if this actually works so I don't have to do the screen back and forth. Yeah, it's all right. What would the membrane voltage have to be in order to prevent the net movement of potassium down its concentration gradient? What would the inside of the cell have to be in order to prevent the net movement of sodium, I'm sorry, potassium, out of the cell? It would have to be really negative, right? Because if it's negative, it's going to attract the potassium and hold it inside the cell, right? All right, so let's go back to our graph here. The equilibrium potential for potassium is usually pretty hyperpolarized, pretty negative compared to zero here. Everybody with me so far? Okay, so we're taking into account not only this concentration gradient, but this electrical force too. I'm going to start calling it a chemical force and an electrical force. All right? Okay, so let's kind of move on to this next concept here, and we're going to really dive into the equilibrium potential and run some numbers. Really run the numbers, do, does it become really clear? Like, oh yeah, this is starting to really make some sense. All right. So as always, I store a point, okay? I like to go back in history and actually talk about it from the scientists who really grappled with this idea. All right, so again, now we're at, we're gonna be talking about specifically the concept of electrochemical equilibrium. We'll revisit the resting membrane potential. I'm going to roll it out right now, but then we're going to really dive into it on Thursday, okay? So here's our learning objectives again. When you get home, you can actually see where we're going with that. I, if I read it to you right now, I, I feel like nobody absorbs it. <laughs> it's not until you get home after you really learn it do you say, oh yeah, now I, now I know exactly what to do and what I'm supposed to be studying for. All right, so this is Julius Bernstein. In 1902, he was actually grappling with how to think about the resting membrane potential that he was actually measuring with a voltmeter. Okay, he's trying to figure this out. What is the resting membrane potential all about? I'm measuring this, this negative value, this negative potential. I'm not sure I'm getting it. So he only knew a few things about the cell. He knew that there was high potassium inside the cell, low potassium outside. He knew that there was high sodium outside the cell, low sodium inside. He also knew that there were impermeable anions. These are the negative charges that are kind of stuck at the membrane there, okay? Um, and he also knew that there was a high conductance for potassium meaning that a lot of potassium was pouring out of the cell, um, but he couldn't really detect any other ions that were moving across the membrane, okay? So take a look at this. Can you all see this down here? Okay, so he could calculate an equilibrium potential for potassium, and I'm gonna teach you how to do that in just a second. And then his voltmeter, actually had, let's just say, the equilibrium potential for potassium was about minus 80 millivolts. And his voltmeter always read about, and this is the resting membrane potential, 
It was always about minus 70 moles. Now, did you notice that I used a solid line to describe this? That's an actual measured value. This is what he was measuring with a voltmeter. And he kind of looked at this and he said, you, he, I can imagine he may have hit his voltmeter a few times. <coughs> and he said, you know, close enough. I think that only potassium is moving across the membrane and the resting membrane potential is at the equilibrium potential for potassium. So only potassium is moving out of the cell and that's how I can think about the resting membrane potential. Okay, so little did he know that there were other ions moving across the membrane which was pulling the resting membrane potential away from the equilibrium potential. Okay. Um, little did he know that, but we're going to talk about this. You're going to see why. Um, but don't, you know, don't count Julius Bernstein out. He actually really captured the essence. Most of the resting membrane potential is due to potassium leaving the cell. So he was really close, right? 90% of the total conductance is due to potassium leaving the cell. And again, he captured the essence of it, but didn't get it quite right. So in the next day, and then through Thursday, we're going to focus on what is the electrochemical equilibrium and the equilibrium potential, and what is the resting membrane potential, and how to think about that, like Julius Bernstein was kind of grappling with. Okay, pretty good? All right, stop me. Ask questions. Again, I try to run a really informal lecture here. Um, here's where we're going. We're going to learn about the difference between the equilibrium potential and the resting membrane potential. OK, so as we've already talked about, the equilibrium potential is the voltage that would have to exist in order to prevent the net movement of any ion down its concentration gradient. Okay, so when you reach, when the actual cell is at the equilibrium potential, then there is no net movement of that ion. This is where the chemical force and the electrical force are exactly balanced but opposite in direction. They're equal in magnitude, but opposite in direction. OK, so um, what you'll learn, too, when I roll out the Goldman Hodgkin cats and, and the cord conductance, if there is only one ion moving across the membrane, like Julius Bernstein thought, if there was only one ion moving across the membrane, then the actual membrane voltage would be the equilibrium potential. So he almost had it right. And you'll see why once I roll out the cord conductance equation. Now, most of the time, the actual, we're going to the bottom here, most of the time, the actual resting membrane potential is not at any of the equilibrium potentials. So you know there's net movement of ions, OK? So that's what it's saying here. This is a steady state condition where there is net movement of ions across the membrane, but it is at steady state. OK, so that may still not resonate with all of you yet. Again, we're going to get some practice. And it's not really going to become clear until you run these numbers, I promise. But let me just give you a visual of how to think about the resting membrane potential. Remember, there is net movement. OK, have you ever gone into a house, a newer build, that actually has those really cool bathrooms? It looks like a clear bowl that's sitting on, in the, you know, on the counter. Have you seen those? I don't even know what they're called. But they're pretty cool. So if you actually turn the faucet on to a certain amount, and the influx 
equals the efflux down the drain. You can pretty much keep that water line constant, right? With me? Okay, that's what steady state is, where the in, there is net movement, where the influx equals the efflux, and it keeps that water line steady, right? Steady state. That's how you can think about the resting membrane potential. There is net movement, but it is at steady state. So resting membrane potential isn't fluctuating wildly, right? It's not going to zero and down to minus 100. It's staying steady at minus 70 millivolts. It's at steady state, okay? So just some definitions. This is the definition of electrochemical equilibrium. Okay, this is where the electrical force and the chemical force are exactly equal. At equilibrium, the equations that describe electrical and chemical work. Now, if you haven't taken physics, that's okay. But work is just equal to force times distance. Okay, so instead of electrical force or chemical force, you can also use the terms work. This is where the electrical work and the chemical work are equal in magnitude, but opposite in direction. All right. So moving right along, everyone. As soon as I get through these next two slides, I'm going to let you do some problems. OK, so you have a chance to kind of work these problems. All right, so now we're concentrating on electro chemical equilibrium. This is what we're, we're going with this. These are the equilibrium potentials, the voltages that must exist in order to prevent the net movement of ion down its concentration gradient. How do we calculate that? How do we know what that voltage would have to be in order to prevent the net movement of an ion down its concentration gradient and make sure that it's exactly balanced so there's no net movement. So these two work terms now have to be equal to each other. The electrical work eventually is going to equal the chemical work. OK, so we're going to set these equal to each other in just a second. But we have to define them. What is the electrical work? Remember, think about that electrical force. It's going to be equal to the charge number of a particular solute. And I will give that to you on an exam. You don't have to memorize that. For sodium, it's one positive charge. For calcium, it's two positive charges. So the Z would actually be two if we were trying to calculate the equilibrium potential for calcium. Now, F is Faraday's constant. OK, this is the amount of charge per mole. And that's just a constant. I will give that to you. Faraday's constant is 96,500 coulombs per mole. OK? And the E is basically the equilibrium potential. And we're going to rearrange this statement because we want to solve for the equilibrium potential. That's the voltage that would have to exist in order, order to prevent the net movement of an ion down its concentration gradient. And at that voltage, the electrical and chemical terms are exactly balanced, and there's no net movement. I'm just going to say that over and over and over again. Okay. So that's our electrical work. Everybody pretty good with that? Electrical work. Now the chemical work. The chemical work is equal to R. Now this is a different R value than the R that we used with osmotic pressure. Remember we used R? The units are different. That's why it's had, there's a different number. Okay. So for R, it's going to be 8.3 joules per Kelvin mole. 
Joules is a unit of energy. Okay? Energy. So it's going to be R times the temperature. And just like before, you'll probably get the temperature in Celsius, and you'll have to convert that to Kelvin. All you have to do is add 273. So if the temperature is body temperature at 37 degrees Celsius, you add 273 to get 310 Kelvin. Okay? And again, you'll run these numbers so it'll become clear. And then the chemical work, you multiply that with the natural log of the concentration of any solute outside over, sorry, this is like a slash, but it should be over the concentration of that solute inside. You can use natural log. I find that that's the easiest to use on your calculator. If you prefer to use log base 10, L-O-G, then you have to multiply 2.303 as a conversion. And that'll all be on the back of your exam. You don't have to memorize any of this. It probably doesn't make a whole lot of sense yet until you start running the numbers, okay? So as I said before, when we're calculating the equilibrium potential, this is where we're calculating the scenario where the electrical work equals the chemical work. They're exactly balanced. And we have to just set the electrical work now equal to our chemical work and then solve for E, our equilibrium potential. And that's what we do right here. See, I have taken the electrical work here and set it equal to the chemical work, I then rearranged the statement to solve for the equilibrium potential. Okay, That would be the voltage that would have to exist in order to prevent that net movement of a particular ion down its concentration gradient. And at that voltage, the electrical and chemical work is exactly balanced. Think about it as a teeter-totter. This is where they're exactly balanced and there's no net movement. Okay, so now it's actually time. It's time to actually do this first problem. All right, we're going to do this first problem set. You're going to have to figure out the equilibrium potentials for both sodium and chloride. So what I'm going to do, just to help you because I just learning from experience. I know if I just throw this at you, it's hard to get started. Okay, so what I'm going to do first is I'm going to do the sodium with you, and then I'm going to let you do the chloride on your own. All right? So let's do this. All right. So here's how you would set it up. I've got my microphone on so I can talk at the board. And you can still hear me. All right, for sodium, the equilibrium potential for sodium. Now I'm going to put sodium here. Remember, we already have some intuition about it. We know it has to be positive, right? Somewhat positive. Okay? So um, that's going to be equal to. RT over ZF times the natural log of the concentration outside, right, 150 over inside. And this is the concentration of sodium. Outside, concentration of sodium inside, 15. Okay, so R is 8.3 joules per mole, Kelvin, sorry, 8.3 joules per mole, Kelvin, and the temperature is 37 degrees Celsius, and like I said before, add 273. Right? And if you do that calculation, 
you can just do it on the board here. So uh, 37 degrees Celsius is equal to, you can just add 273, 10, 1, 3. Should equal 310 Kelvin. Just add 273. All right, so we're going to multiply this by 310 Kelvin. How, what is the Z in this case? What is the Z? 1, plus 1. Okay. So the Z is plus 1 because sodium has one positive charge associated with it. And Faraday's constant is 96,500 coulombs, a unit of charge, over mole. All right, so what I like to do is I like to do the back end first. Divide 150 by 15 and then take the natural log. You know what you got. I got two point three. Yep, two point three oh three maybe. Two point three. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. Two point three oh three. Okay, I'm just going to put that in parentheses. I'll plug that in a little bit later. 2.303. That's right. All right, now taking a look at this one, let's just take a look at our units for a second. Okay? So when you multiply 8.3 joules per mole Kelvin, multiply that with 3 by 310 Kelvin, Kelvins actually cancel out. Okay? I can actually even ca cancel out our millimoles here. They're going to cancel out. Moles are going to cancel out. And my units are going to be left with joules per coulomb. All right, so now I actually do this part. 8.3 times 310 divided by 96,500. Let me know what you get. Three times three ten over ninety six thousand five hundred. What was it? Zero point zero two six. Zero point zero two six. All right. So we're going to multiply zero point zero two six times two point three zero three, and our units are joules per coulomb. 0.061. Okay, so here's our answer. 0 0.061 joules per coulomb. What is that? It's a volt. Absolutely right. Joules per coulomb is a volt. Joules per coulomb is a volt. So what are the millivolts? How do we convert 0.061 volts to millivolts? Multiply by 1,000. So our answer is plus 61 millivolts. See? Pretty high, uh, depolarized, very positive value. 61 millivolts. Perfect. That would be the voltage that would have to exist in order to prevent the net movement of sodium into the cell down its concentration gradient. And at this exact voltage, this is where the electrical and chemical work are exactly balanced, and there's no net movement. Okay, pretty good. All right, so I'm going to let you go do chloride on your own. 
And then when you get the answer, you can turn to your neighbor, you can do it together. So it's still just the theoretical value. That would be the voltage that would have to increase in order. So if you could manipulate the rest of the membrane, you need to attack the current to move the membrane voltage around. If you impose a current and you remove the membrane voltage, it's about 61 millivolts, then you're measuring it. And it is right at the equilibrium potential. And then you know there's no magnetic. All right. Does someone have an answer? Does someone have an answer for me? What do you think? Negative 50? 15. I think it's a little bit more hyperpolarized. Yeah, negative 36. That's it. Okay, so we can talk about that too. So, um, in fact, we'll just go through it together. Um, okay, so the answer is minus 36.6. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's good enough. Uh, it is minus 36 millivolts. Minus 36 millivolts. So remember, this is a dashed line. The equilibrium potential for chloride, which is a negative value, is minus 36 millivolts. Okay, below zero, minus 36 millivolts. Okay, um, just remember, I mean, I'm just going to go back here. Remember, our concentration gradient is built right in. So if we change the concentration gradient, it's going to have an effect on the equilibrium potential of any solute, just so you know. So let me just erase this. All right, this is how you would set it up. The equilibrium potential for chloride is going to be equal to 8.3 joules per mole Kelvin. Temperature is still the same, 310 Kelvin. Over what's the Z? Negative 1. That's absolutely right. Negative 1, 96,500. Uh, coulombs per mole, and in this case, it's going to be the natural log 
What's the concentration outside? What's, what is it? 155. And inside? 40. Thank you. Okay. That's how I would set it up. I usually like to do the back end first, kind of write down that number, do the front end, and then multiply the two together. And then it's going to be in volts, so you have to actually then convert it to millivolts. Okay? Minus 36 millivolts should be the answer. Okay, now we have about 15 minutes, and now I'm going to add on again. Okay, add on. All right, so this is going to be how you're going to now predict which way the ion is moving. And I can tell you right before the first exam, that is my number one question. Students, come into my office. I still don't quite understand which way the ions are moving, right? I anticipate that. I welcome that. I encourage you guys to come in. Uh, but as soon as you get this, it's all going to become crystal clear. Okay, so this takes a little bit of practice, and problem set two, part two, is just more of the same, more practice. All right, so now that we know our equilibrium potentials, and we've already drawn our graph, right? So you have already done 1C. This is the graph that I want you to draw, right? All right, how do we predict which way the ion is moving? Okay. Now, our resting membrane potential isn't at minus 70. Our measured resting membrane potential is what? It's in the question. Minus 65. Minus 65 millivolts. So I had a good question while you guys were deliberating. Um, here is where the resting membrane potential is if I pass a positive current into the cell. And I force this measured value up to plus 61 millivolts so that the equilibrium potential equals the resting membrane potential. Then I would know there would be no net movement of sodium. Okay? But our actual measured voltage that we measured with the voltmeter is at minus 65 millivolts, okay? And so now we're trying to figure out which way are these ions moving? Because the resting membrane potential is not at any of these equilibrium potentials. So we know there's net movement of these ions, right? We know there's net movement, but it's at steady state. Okay, so what I like to do is I like to draw a cell Right? I like to kind of draw the chemical or concentration gradients. So the sodium outside is higher than the sodium inside. Sodium has a positive charge. Chloride outside is greater than the chloride inside. Okay? And I'm just focusing on these charges inside the cell. All right, so here's what I want you to kind of get. Here's our concentration gradient, okay? Now, you have to ask yourself your, I want you to star this like three times. Your reference is the equilibrium potential. Don't mix that up with the resting membrane potential. Your reference is the equilibrium potential. I'm going to keep my hand here. Where is the resting membrane potential relative to the equilibrium potential? Look at our graph. Is it more negative or is it more positive? It's not too hard of a question. <coughs> Don't be shy. More negative. It's more negative. Way more negative. Right? Here's our reference. One of the biggest mistakes that students make is they start to use the resting membrane potential as their reference. Don't do that. 
You're simply asking the question, where is the resting membrane potential relative to my reference? And it's more negative. So this is kind of a parlor trick, but it helps me all the time. I just put a negative sign in the middle of the cell. It's not a real, I didn't measure that. I just put a negative sign in there. Sodium is a positive ion. Got a negative sign in there. They're going to attract. And sodium will continue to move down its concentration gradient into the cell. Because the chemical work is still greater than the electrical work. Okay, so now think about our teeter-totter. The chemical work is still greater than the electrical work. So another way of saying that is the electrical work is not sufficient enough to prevent the net movement of sodium down its concentration gradient. So sodium will continue to move into the cell. What would the voltage have to be in order to switch directions. Yeah? Greater than 61. Greater than 61. Absolutely right. So if it's at plus 100, then the electrical work is so great, so positive inside the cell, that it's going to start to move sodium against a very large concentration gradient out of the cell. Making sense? Starting to come together? That's the beauty of the equilibrium potential. All right, so let's try this now for chloride. Here is the concentration gradient, right? The concentration gradient, if we were just taking into that account alone, is going to be from outside to inside. That's going to be the net movement. So here is our reference. Here's the equilibrium potential. Is the resting membrane potential more positive or more negative than our reference? More negative, right? So I'm just going to put a little negative ion again in here. However, this time chloride is also a negative ion. OK, so what's going to happen? Which way is chloride going to be moving? Out of the cell, against a concentration gradient. Chloride is going to be moving out of the cell, against its concentration gradient, because now the electrical work is much greater than the chemical work. Okay, Teeter-totter. Now the electrical work is greater than the chemical work and it's going to start to move chloride out of the cell against its concentration gradient. So if you haven't figured that out now, too, this is referred to as down the concentration gradient, if it's going with the concentration gradient, or against the concentration gradient. OK? Um, I also heard some students talking about the pump, too. I just Thought I'd elaborate on that too. I almost forgot before. Uh, the reason why the pump actually establishes, establishes these gradients is because for every turn of the pump, it removes sodium, three sodium, out of the cell, and it brings in two potassium into the cell. So you can see how that establishes the concentration gradient. Just want to make sure. I didn't really elaborate on that before. So you should be able to do most of these problems except predicting the resting membrane potential. Um, I know that for a lot of you, this actually seems very clear right now. Sometimes you get home and it gets really fuzzy again. And that's OK, right? You get home and go, oh my gosh, that seemed so clear when I was in class. And now I'm a little confused. That's why. It's all about right now practice, 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 practice. Okay? These are very, very hard concepts. These aren't easy. So I hope that I have kind of rolled it out in a way that's more palatable. 
Does everybody feel good? Do you want to go through one more or you feel pretty good? Like you want to go home and just like, okay, I can do this. You want to go through one more? Okay. Uh, let's do potassium. Okay, let's just pretend we've calculated the equilibrium potential for potassium. All right, let's figure out our concentration gradient. Okay. Potassium is very high inside the cell relative to outside. Okay. And remember, this is one of the most common mistakes. Remember what your reference is. Your reference is the equilibrium potential. So now ask yourself, where does the resting membrane potential sit? relative to my reference. Which way is potassium going to be moving? So, is the resting membrane potential more positive or more negative? More positive, right? It's actually more positive. All right, so we put a little positive sign in here. Potassium has a positive charge. Potassium is going to continue to move out of the cell with its concentration gradient. Okay? Now, what you'll notice, if I went to sodium and my resting membrane potential was anything more negative, it's going to have a net movement, I can say this is actually going to go in. Everything below this line, sodium will be going into the cell. Okay. Everything more negative. Everything above this line is going to start moving sodium out. Okay. Potassium is the same. They're both cations. So anything above this line is going to go in. I'm sorry, out. Sorry, I'm right back. Out. Same orientation. Everything more negative. Switch directions, and potassium will be going into the cell against its large concentration gradient. Now, cations are all the same. Out in, out in. But my anion has been flipped. Right? Anion is going to be in, out. Chew on that for a little bit. These are all a little bit of like brain teasers. Okay? Wait, so the potassium is moving along its concentration gradient? Yes. Okay. So it'll continue to go out of the cell, down its concentration gradient, or with its concentration gradient. Okay. okay? Why is that? Why is that? Because okay. Like, I know yep. I, I get the positive thing, but what yeah. I don't get is like, with the sodium, we had a positive and a negative, so mm -hmm. they attracted, right. and then it went along it, and now we right. have a positive. So basically, the orientations are the same, but the concentration gradients have been flipped. Okay. Yeah, sodium tends to go into the cell because it's high outside, low inside. Potassium tends to go out of the cell because it's high concentration outside, so inside. If that was yeah, so basically if here's our reference and it's more negative, okay. then we would put a negative sign in here and then it would start attracting potassium into the cell against its large concentration okay. gradient. Okay. All right, I think I've thrown enough at you today. I really hope this helps. Uh, work on those problem sets and I will pick this up on Thursday. All right, good job. Oh, don't forget to turn in your group video project and your problem set number one. Hi. Okay, great. It's five total. Okay, so perfect. Oh, sure, absolutely.
Are you with actually Nicole? Yeah. Okay. Um, just give me your name or send me an email and I'll just put you with the group. Okay, sounds yeah. Good. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Hello.